Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today um, for this webinar on gender smart strategies in last mile distribution. I'm Charlotte Taylor and I lead the communications activities for the GDC. Um, and we have a really packed schedule today. My aim is to talk for as little time as possible so that you can hear from our expert speakers on the call today. So I'm gonna jump straight into the agenda and some housekeeping before we kick off properly. So after this really brief scene setting from me, Value for Women, who is co-hosting this session, will provide a top level introduction to the three companies featured in our panel, as well as the business challenge they faced and the strategies that they piloted to address these challenges. We will then hear insights directly from our GDC member experts on the call, Diva Bits Green Energy, Wana Energy Solutions, we hope, and Yellow. The second part of today's webinar is a presentation from GDC member UPower on their experience of developing and implementing a gender action plan over the past year. So the idea for today is really first to kind of dive into specific gender inclusive interventions and lessons learned before taking a step back to think more broadly about how to go about mainstreaming gender throughout your company. As always, if you have any questions, please drop these into the chat box, which you'll find in the bar at the bottom of your screen. We're really familiar with Zoom by now. Uh, the GDC and Value for Women teams, um, as well as our expert speakers, will be keeping an eye on this and, and answer questions that we can as we go. And we also have time towards the end of the session for a dedicated Q&A. Um, I know that there's been loads of interest and hopefully we'll see lots of other GDC members on the call today. I can already see a few. So if you are a GDC member and you've got valuable insights to share and you want to kind of share those in the chat, please do. Finally, a couple of bits of housekeeping. So you should all be on mute. If you're not, please mute yourselves. Um, and please stay like this to avoid background noise for our speakers today. We'd appreciate it if you could also rename yourself in Zoom to include the name of your company and so that we can see who's on the call and kind of get a feel for who's with us today. And I should also flag that we're recording the webinar and we'll share this with you in follow up along with the contact details of our speakers today in case you want to reach out directly for more information. So today's session is to some extent a follow up to a webinar that we co-hosted with Value for Women back in October 2020, which looked at the theory behind different gender inclusive strategies that are relevant for last mile distributors. Um, and today is really about bringing those strategies to life with first hand case studies and insights from GDC members themselves. Given that we want to focus on these very tangible experiences, we're not going to spend a huge amount of time today reiterating the case for why gender inclusion is good for business, but hopefully you think it is and that's why you're here today. Um, but if you are interested to hear more on that, then do check out our previous webinar, which is available on the GDC website. Next slide, please. So I'll now pass over to Stephanie Finnegan, Director of Programmes at Valley for Women, to say a few words and introduce our panel. Great. Thank you, Charlotte, so much for that introduction. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining on the call today. Um, I'm really excited to be here to facilitate a conversation with three of the um, panelists who are going to be joining us who really led this initiative um, on the ground, really demonstrating how gender inclusion um, is has been impactful in their own business. And we're really hoping today to spend a lot of time talking um, very practically about the, the how to when it comes to gender inclusion um, for last mile distributors. Um, I, like Charlotte, am planning on speaking as little as possible, but I will just spend a moment introducing Value for Women, um, which uh, some of you might not know, um, and then I'll turn it over to our, our panelists after introducing them. Um, but very, very briefly, Value for Women is a global consulting firm, and we work with a variety of partners really at the intersection of gender inclusion and business. Um, our partners, as you can see here on the slide, really vary. We work with um, impact investors, DFIs, banks, financial institutions. Um, SMEs uh, directly as well as entrepreneurs um, and we are sector agnostic so we work across um, across sectors but really trying to focus on helping our partners incorporate gender inclusion into their own organizations as well as in, into the portfolio of um, programs and projects that they work on. And what really sets us apart as an organization is a, is a heavy focus on um, action-oriented, practical, um, and really hands-on collaborative approaches um, that, we, that we carry out with our partners, um, aiming to have measurable results. 
Um, and this approach is what we call a business first approach to gender inclusion, which really helps us um, align um, our, our own values and understanding of the impact business can have on gender with the partners that we're working with. Next slide, please. Just briefly about the business first approach to gender inclusion, because that's what we applied when we worked with um, GDC partners and in the initiative you're about to hear about. Um, we really emphasize the idea that, um, that this business first approach means that we meet businesses where they are. Um, so we, we try and aim to provide a practical entry point for businesses when it comes to engaging in gender inclusion, understanding that businesses across the board um, are at different points in their gender journey. And there's no right or wrong way to start. The, the, the key is just to get started when it comes to gender inclusion. Um, and so we really work to determine what are the best entry points for the, for the partners that we're working with um, and how can we really meet, um, meet those business needs while in incorporating a gender lens into those work, into that work. Um, and the big focus here is really trying to um, break down traditional barriers that we've seen between gender inclusion in the private sector. And what I mean there is specifically, um, there tends to be um, a focus on um, a few key areas and specifically HR um, and HR policies. Um, that seems to be a very common entry point for businesses when it comes to gender inclusion. And while we agree that's important and we do a lot of work there, we also really wanna emphasize that gender inclusion is something that can be incorporated across businesses um, in ways that might not always be traditionally obvious. So we do a lot of that work with our partners and you're gonna hear some great examples today from the panelists um, who will be speaking in just a moment. And finally, as Charlotte reiterated, we also as an organization don't focus as much on the, on the why of gender inclusion as we do now on the how. And it's because we understand there's been a growth um, in, the, in the industries where, uh, that we work in where folks are really understanding the importance of gender inclusion in business. Um, um, and the need for it, but it's the practical how where businesses understandably can get um, tripped up. Um, and so our focus is really on that practical how um, in helping businesses to understand um, on a practical level how it is that they can apply um, gender inclusion to their work. And so that's what we're really gonna focus on today. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panelists, um, and then we'll turn the rest of the conversation over to them. Um, I believe we have two of the three panelists on. Um, I think one of our panelists has not yet joined, but if I'm wrong, someone just message me and tell me. But in the meantime, um, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce them all as is, and, and hopefully um, Emmy will join us shortly. Um, but first, we have um, David Wanju, who is the CEO of uh, DivaBits Green Energy. Um, and DivaBits is a last mile distributor providing solar products to all off-grid rural regions in Kenya. Um, DivaBits has a commission-based sales agents, a sales agent uh, structure, um, and those agents are called Village Social Entrepreneurs, or VSEs, that are really central to DivaBits' um, distribution model. Um, the majority of the VSEs at DivaBits are women, and the majority of top performers um, in, the, um, in the organization are women as well. Um, and what the business challenge was that DivaBits came to us with was this, um, an understanding that the VSEs on their team were um, at varying points in terms of performance, um, and, and we didn't quite have an analysis of why that was. And so we wanted to undertake an analysis, to a gender analysis, to determine what the challenges were that were facing um, women agents, and were those um, challenges transferable to male agents, and how could best practices be pulled out that could benefit all agents uh, at the organization. So we, we piloted with DivaBits a number of strategies, including um, pitch practices for, uh, for generating more sales, um, trainings, on converting leads, as well as um, skills to increase um, the outreach to women uh, and men customers. Um, and as you'll hear from David today, there were some really interesting results that DivaBit saw um, after implementing these different trainings and strategies, um, including reported increased confidence from agents, as well as increased customer awareness um, on the behalf of agents. Um, and these are all in service of um, leading to increased performance by sales agents. So very exciting, and I'm excited to have David with us today. Next, we have um, Cynthia um, Makungaya from uh, Yellow. She is the head of Malawi operations at Yellow, which is an LMD focused on solar home system distribution in Malawi and Uganda. Um, and Yellow has over 500 sales agents working for them as well. In Malawi, very few women have applied for the solar sector sales agent jobs. Um, and this was challenging for, um, for Cynthia and the Yellow team as they understood that women agents were actually outperforming male agents 
when given the opportunity, but women agents weren't applying as much for those jobs due to um, a number of factors, including a lack of access to a smartphone, which is um, a prerequisite for the job, as well as a common perception um, that this role was, the sales role was really a man's job. And so it was, there were some cultural challenges and social challenges that were hurdles for women to overcome in applying. So the yellow team rolled out what they called a scouts program for local sales agents to really incentivize the recruitment of women, um, as well as um, adopted gender inclusive job advertisement practices. Um, and as a result of doing that, as well as implementing a digital skill, uh, skills training for young women and girls that will help encourage them to apply for these uh, solar agent opportunity roles, um, Yellow saw fantastic results. They had gone from uh, one woman sales agent in 2018 to today, 22% um, of the sales force is made up of women with 33% uh, of um, the company's top earners being women. So really fantastic results. And I'm excited to have Cynthia here today. And finally, um, we don't yet have Emmy on the line, um, and I believe that's an internet issue, as I know that was a challenge for him um, in the days recently, but I'll introduce um, Emmy Wasira anyway, um, and hopefully he can join us. Um, but Emmy is the CEO of WANA Energy Solutions, and WANA is a Uganda-based company that's focused on LPG um, as clean and accessible source for energy um, and for cooking, um, and as an alternative to biomass. Um, and WANA's distribution model also um, involves commission-based sales agents and over 60% of their agents are women. The challenge they faced um, is one which many organizations with commission-based agents face, which is mobility challenges for women agents. Um, and they found that these mobility challenges um, were really negatively impacting the potential that women agents had to, um, to perform in terms of sales um, because they weren't able to access um, motorbikes that, was, that are typically used by agents um, due to cultural norms in Uganda. Um, as well as um, challenges um, regarding um, other, other uh, issues with accessing public transportation. Um, and so what the WANA team did was went ahead and tested um, various pilots to help address these mobility challenges, including piloting allowances for agents to cover public transportation costs, um, and eventually a motorbike provision as well, um, in order to facilitate travel for all agents, including women, women sales agents in particular. Um, they also saw great success in the first month of the pilot, um, um, they actually saw a 41% increase in total sales um, after the allowance of the travel provisions and the motorbike uh, provisions launched. So really exciting results from them. Um, if Emmy's not able to join us today to speak directly um, on the panel to want a success, um, I'll just give a preview that um, there will be a forthcoming paper um, from GDC and Value for Women that's going to feature many case studies um, similar to those you'll hear today, including that of WANA, as well as other partners who um, are not on today's panel. So um, be on the lookout for that paper um, as it's coming. It will hopefully be a very, um, very useful how-to guide um, for uh, last mile distributors looking to apply this work. So with that, um, I will, I'm going to turn it over. As I said, that's, I think it's enough talking for me. I'm going to turn it over to our panelists who've actually done the work um, and, and have a lot, uh, a lot of information to share that's hopefully going to be quite useful to the folks on the call today. Um, and so I'm going to start with, um, with David from DivaBits. Um, if, if you're ready for me, David, I've got some questions for you regarding that, um, that best practices sales training um, that we, that I just spoke about um, that, uh, that DivaBits implemented. Um, so first and foremost, just um, uh, just want to congratulate you on a successful pilot, um, and um, and we were very excited at Value Women, Value for Women, to see the the work that was being done by your team. I was hoping you could speak today a little bit about the impacts that you saw in carrying out that um, that best practices sales training for men and women, um, and particularly the impacts on women agents' capacity as a result of the training. Thank you, Stephanie, uh, for that question. Um, yeah, so we had very interesting impact, especially uh, working with women sales agents uh, uh, and focusing on gender focused sales training. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of the impact we had was uh, measured in terms of increased capacity for sales agents. And in this angle, you know, we have kind of increased capacity in different angles. One is the ability to make better sales and, uh, and high value sales. And this is because now they had more confidence to actually be able to not only sell small products, but to be able even to each uh, bigger product. And <clears throat> this is a result of uh, this kind of training. And because they, you know, they learned a lot of 
skills in terms of how to pitch uh, to customers differently, how to understand the needs of these customers uh, in terms of even with a gender angle, you know, you know, men have different kind of needs to women, or even what, uh, you know, pain points are. And, and with this angle, you know, they became more confident in terms of um, how they approach customers, how they make pitch. And, you know, this resulted to better sales. And with this kind of improved sales, we had a lot of these agents, you know, starting to have increased uh, commissions uh, for every month they're earning. And, you know, this results to a lot of, you know, better improved livelihoods for them in this rural communities. And also not to, you know, uh, not to forget that um, with this kind of training, we also impacted them in terms of uh, capacity, in terms of how they plan their work. So there was a component on, you know, work planning, you know, and use of even WhatsApp uh, as a tool for targeting more customers. So, you know, these women sales agents had uh, more capacity beyond just that, you know, the few sales you know, tricks, uh, but also they could use WhatsApp to be able to target more people and even have better planning for, you know, their day-to-day -day field sales work. That's fantastic, David. And I, I, what I really like about this is that a lot of times there's a focus on um, the hard skills when it comes to up, um, training agents on sales. Um, and I really appreciate about this pilot that um, that you were able to measure um, not only the increase in sort of firm hard skills, but also in what we would consider sort of the softer skills and softer areas, including um, confidence and seeing how that increase in confidence um, in women agents can actually does translate into, into increased performance in terms of sales. I think that's really, really interesting and, um, and very important as folks are thinking about sort of how to measure their own, um, their own efforts going forward. Um, I also know, um, of course, whenever you're implementing anything new at an organization, there's always challenges and hurdles to overcome. Um, and so I'd be curious if you could um, speak a little bit about how you're continuing to implement um, this, um, this gender-focused sales training in your organization and any challenges you, you have been facing in doing so and how you might have overcome those. Yeah, um, that's a very good question. Um, yes, uh, we have continued implementing the gender-focused sales training. Um, matter of fact, you know, we have adopted the gender-focused training in organization. And, you know, we have, you know, made it like a way of, our, our standard way of training our sales managers and sales agents. Uh, so today, like we have trained all of the sales managers and majority of our sales agents, uh, both women and men are sales agents. We realize that the sales, um, the gender focused training actually works for both of them. You know, it's, and, and this is with the angle that Stephen had mentioned that, you know, we had a lot of you know, female sales agents that were selling better than a lot of men sales agents. And now transferring this kind of skills to our agents, uh, to men sales uh, agents also, you know, has, you know, trying, you know, is also improving the actual performance in terms of their monthly sales targets. Um, and, and, you know, we are continuing to do this uh, going forward. And one of the you know, challenges that of course uh, we have faced is, you know, in terms of the way the training is structured, you know, we realize that uh, you actually need small groups, you know, about 10 people uh, in a training. This is because of the component of what you call more practical training rather than theoretical training. So in, in this uh, gender focused training, there was a lot of focus in what you call peer to peer learning. Uh, you know, and it involved a lot of what you call role modeling uh, or role play, uh, where agents or you know, best sales people would actually, you know, try and see or, or pitch, you know, how they pitch to customers, how they handle objections and all of these things. So, you know, you need a little bit intimate group to ensure this training is happening. And so that's one of the critical challenge because now we realize now to effect these trainings across uh, all our counties, uh, the training could not take technically one day, you know, we, so we had to uh, adjust to two days training. And therefore, it means that uh, as a company, you have to invest a little bit in terms of uh, budget and time uh, to ensure that uh, you train a lot of the agents. So if you, for example, you have 300 sales agents, uh, it means you might have uh, 30 different training groups, you know, with uh, kind of like two days of training focused. And, and this is because you, know, you want to not only really empower them in, you know, with both, you know, the soft and the hard skills in terms of the, you know, understanding the products, the technical bits, and even customer service. So this is kind of a little bit of challenge, but it's really, really manageable as we scale. 
That's great. Um, thank you for that, David. Yeah, I think you've touched on a lot of important issues um, that come up when folks are sort of implementing something like this. Um, but I think it's it's really interesting to hear about how you've addressed those um, and that those are, they end up, I think at Value for Women, we like to say there's no um, cookie cutter approach to gender inclusion. And I think there's no cookie cutter approach to, um, to adopting any sales training. Um, and so the way that you've been able to really customize it, particularly to, to support the women agents um, is, is really uh, well done. Um, Cynthia, I'll turn over to you now to hear a bit about Yellow. Um, so I know, again, your, um, your focus has been on um, recruiting sales agents and increasing the, um, the number of women sales agents, and you've had a tremendous amount of success in doing that. Um, I'm hoping you can speak to the main impacts that you've seen um, on women in particular um, that are continuing um, even after you've, um, you've done the rollout of this strategy, um, and if there's any new areas of impact that you're seeing since you've, um, since you've rolled out this recruitment strategy. Thank you so much, Steph. Stephanie. Um, so when we began rolling out our gender inclusive program and also a project we dubbed Kumbo, named after our first female agent, um, we have seen quite a massive impact uh, on the female agents. So I'll touch on three of them. The first one was an improvement in their livelihoods. So majority of the female agents that we have managed to recruit over time were either stay at home moms, unemployed, or running micro businesses that were not taking off due to a lack of access to capital. But um, from the time that they joined Yellow and became sales agents, they've been earning up to $100 per week now, and if not more. Uh, some of them have returned to school to complete their education, and they're also able to pay their family's tuition. So I guess in this case, the, the major impact being their ability to earn an income, which leads me to the second impact that we saw and we're still seeing over time, and that is some of our female agents have started to own businesses and they've become entrepreneurs. So they have opened their own boutiques, um, hair salons, they are into large scale farming, they're running agribusinesses, so buying and selling agricultural commodities, all of which, all of which with, they were unable to do because they, there was a lack of access to capital. Um, and they've also been able to give capital to their family members to start their own businesses so that they too become um, independent. And the last impact um, that I wanted to touch on as well was the progress we've made in br bridging the gender gap within our agent network, which is essentially the challenge we were trying to address. And that is to get more female or women um, sales agents to be part of the solar distribution value chain. So we've moved from having one female agent to over 140 and counting. And something that was a ripple effect of these strategies is that the male agents were in high support of recruiting more women agents. And they're actually on the forefront of advocating for this every time we um, advertise that we're looking for sales agents. And so it's great to see that despite the cultural norms that exist, um, you know, the gaps that exist, the gender gaps that exist within our agent network, within our communities, there are still men out there who truly believe that men, women should be a part of the um, renewable energy sector and they should become sales agents because of these impacts and more that they can reap from it. And they're right at the forefront of advocating for the same. That's really interesting, Cynthia. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I, it, it comes up a lot in the work that um, that Value for Women does with Last Mile Distributors and other and other similar structured businesses, where um, there's questions about is this going to be a challenge for um, for male agents if we have an increase in in women in female agents coming on, um, and is that going to be um, you know a challenge in terms of their own performance or um, you know, increased competition and things of that nature. Um, and it's really, um, we've seen uh, at Valley for Women similar results to what you're seeing, which is frankly, um, everybody benefits when, you know, when there are more good agents in the organization, everyone benefits from that. Um, and so it's really great to see that that's, um, that's sort of happening um, in, in terms of your own internal organizational culture. Um, that's great. And, and a follow-up question for you then, um, mm -hmm. also much like I said to David, um, there's always challenges that are faced when you're implementing something new. So could you tell us a little bit just about some of the main challenges you faced when you were implementing this new recruitment strategy? Um, absolutely. So when we were going through the entire process, Uh, 
um, the low in Malawi, the literacy rate for men is at 73% versus 59 for women. And, um, you know, if you look at the way that our, our recruitment is handled, which is purely online and requires English literacy, uh, by default, the women were at a disadvantage. And so some of the things that we've done is we've ended up needing to translate some of the training content. We have put more focus so that uh, the team that coaches the agents puts more focus on trying to get sure that the, trying to ensure that the women um, fully understand what's required of them through the trainings and through the tests and the entire recruitment process. Um, the second challenge was the wide tech gap that exists. So now we're not only battling a gender gap, we're also bat battling a tech gap. So most of the women that we um, interact with and then and even now, we're unfamiliar with smartphone use, let alone the software itself in question compared to their male counterparts who gain access to technology faster than women because they have the means. Most of them are either running a business or working somewhere so they can afford to actually buy a smartphone. Um, and also just this one is a little general to like both male and female, but it did affect us when we we're conducting the the trainings for the women in rural areas, and that was network coverage. So it led to the trainings drag, dragging out for longer periods. And, you know, or as it is, we have a smaller portion of female applicants. And if they are at a disadvantage because of the network, then it means by and far they will fall out of the funnel eventually. And touching, just reverting back to my point about the smartphones, so lack of access and knowledge of uh, how to use smartphones. Because women do not have access to smartphones, um, it also meant that they're not knowledgeable on how to use them and therefore they were at a disadvantage to actually apply to become an agent, even if they were interested or had the capacity to do it. And so in throughout you know, this period, we've had to be um, a lot more intentional in the support that we're giving to the women. So for instance, when we were conducting the workshops and training the 592 women we trained in digital skills, we actually took some of our already existing, so contracted female agents, to come and help them because they best understood what it's like working in the field with these challenges and much more. And so it was the peer to peer learning was quite um, essential in ensuring that we get more and more female um, candidates interested in becoming an agent, but also improving their performance over time. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks for sharing that. And I think the peer-to-peer -peer learning is something that um, that time and again we see is, is a significant advantage for organizations that adopt that. And I think um, David's done something similar at DivaBits with the sort of shared um, sales trainings and um, in ensuring that men and women agents are both getting um, equal access to, um, to the trainings um, and really learning from each other about what, what's worked best. Um, so with that, David, as you are looking ahead um, at DivaBits um, uh, in terms of kind of what, what's coming next, um, I know that there's been um, focus on, and you mentioned it earlier, on WhatsApp and sort of other more te technologies for, um, for agents. Um, so for women agents who are interested in, um, in different ways of learning to sell, including WhatsApp-based WhatsApp -based marketing and sales, um, how are you helping them to access smartphones and how are you helping them to, to get engaged um, further in that type of sales initiative? Thank you, Stephanie, for the question. Um, yeah, so we have, you know, identified WhatsApp-based uh, marketing as a really important tool as, you know, we advance in terms of technology. And, you know, Kenya has become a very interesting place where mobile phone technology has been accepted. And, you know, a lot of, Few of our agents have smartphones, but we also have majority of um, agents uh, who don't have smartphones. So we are implementing several strategies to support uh, our women's sales agents. And you know, some of these strategies include, um, you know, giving rewards for smartphones, especially for hitting certain sales targets. Um, and we try to do this frequently so that we can give uh, most, you know, uh, women agents more chances to get these rewards. Uh, we also issuing our smartphones on credit. Um, and this is uh, <clears throat> some of the agents that are earning some decent uh, commissions on month to month basis because we understand, you know, you know, this one gives a lot of confidence that they are doing actually uh, good sales and they're treating this work seriously. Uh, so we're able to give phones, uh, basic uh, smartphones, and, uh, you know, we have them repair over a period of, you know, within one year. And this is increasing uh, the number of women, you know, sales agents that you know have smartphones in the organization, 
And you know, the other component that we are trying to do is, you know, um, part of the training was, you know, part of you know how to use WhatsApp and digital, you know, tools. And in addition to that, we, you know, that kind of knowledge, we're also supporting them with uh, developing digital content. Um, and you know, this could be simple uh, imagery, you know, for, for pro, you know a product or a simple video, a short video for a certain product that can explain a certain product, even the pricing. And we are sharing this with them so that they can be able to, you know, share their within their WhatsApp channel or you know on their WhatsApp status or you know broadcasting to their uh, customer prospects. So these are some of the uh, uh, support that we are working to support them so that they not only just have a smartphone, but they also have uh, you know content to use on their WhatsApp uh, channels. That's great. And I think Cynthia also touched on, you know, we know the importance of smartphones for um, for Yellow's business as well. And I think the um, the digital divide between men and women is a, is a whole other topic we can spend another um, another webinar talking about. But um, but it's great to see the efforts that both your companies, um, Diva Bits and, and Yellow, are making to try and close that for your sales agents. Um, so thanks for sharing that, David. Um, and Cynthia, over to you um, in terms of looking ahead. Um, for Yellow, what are your plans to continue um, to build the capacity of the women agents that you have? You've made great strides thus far. Um, what are your plans as you look forward? Okay, so we continue, we are, and we're continue, we plan on continuing to make sure that our agent recruitment process remains women-centric. Um, so some of the small, small you know, my Many changes we've made that have had a massive impact. We, you know, portray a, a woman installing a solar panel, um, and they look not looking scared, but they're doing it well. Then it encourages another, you know, woman out there who initially thought that this is supposed to be a man's job only to say, "I think I could give it a go." If we have more, we have more of our female agents who we've published a couple of success stories, which I believe I'm not quite sure if I shared with you, but I'd be happy to share these as well. Um, if we can have more of those women becoming um, role models in their societies, then it definitely does um, motivate other women out there to become a part of uh, not just yellow in general, but the renewable energy sector, which is, um, I say, in growth in the growth stage, especially in the sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is to increase the incentives for, not looking at what we've done, is we have doubled the incentive for agent scouts um, to recruit or to refer more female candidates to us. So just for, just, um, sorry, there was... Okay, if everyone could please mute, just remember to mute your well, folks that are listening in on the webinar, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, um, so the just for context, the Agent Scout program is basically one in which we invite the general public to refer candidates to us. So they go through the recruitment process and once they become contracted agents, one, Again, if everyone could just please mute. I'm sorry, I'm um, getting so that, quite a lot of feedback. Yeah, I think I think we're we should be okay now, Cynthia. See if that's better. Thank you, everyone, for muting. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was explaining the agent scout program to say um, once the once the agent becomes contracted, then we give a reward to the person that referred them to yellow. To, so to the agent scout, and so we've doubled um, the reward for female. Um, candidates who actually make it and become contracted agents. And um, the other thing, the other thing that um, strategy that we're looking at to build capacity of our agents is to, uh, we're looking to fundraise um, for a similar project, but one we can execute at a larger scale. So, you know, we can train more women, we can, you know, provide more cell phones and also provide more training on how to use those cell phones so that, you know, the women are fully equipped to um, execute their roles as sales agents going forward. Excellent, those are great examples, Cynthia, and thank you for sharing those. Um, I'm excited to see what Yellow does in the future, so be excited to, to look out for that. Um, we just have about one minute left um, before we move on to the next section of the webinar. So with that, I'll just ask for um, just a rapid fire response here, but would love to hear um, from the both of you, David and, um, and um, Cynthia, on um, your top learning or top takeaway from the strategies that you've implemented. If you just had one top takeaway 
and can give it to us in 30 seconds. So that would be, um, that would be great. It'll help us land the plane right on time. Um, and I'll, um, Cynthia, why don't I start with you and then David will wrap up with you. All right, I'll try and keep it under 30 seconds. So um, becoming our, the key takeaway from this was becoming more gender inclusive, specifically in the renewable energy sector requires great intention, passion and focus. So at Yellow, we live to help others live better. And essentially, this means we have a responsibility towards providing women with opportunities to become um, economic participants and engage with different technologies that can improve their standard of living. It does not mean that we're spoon feeding women or giving handouts but rather we're equipping them with the right um, tools, skills and knowledge to empower them to be successful in whatever capacity they participate in the economy in the interim and beyond. So specifically to us, that would be as sales agents. So we've seen what such intention can yield through the strategies we've implemented and we are ready to take on the challenge of ensuring that more women engage in this sector, not just as primary users of energy in the home, but um, to play a pivotal role um, in the value chain of the distribution of solar energy and to continue to earning an income as I explained the different benefits that they've reaped, um, which they can. And so once they earn this income, they're able to invest in themselves, their families and their businesses. So that's kind of what we learned from everything that we've done so far. Fantastic. Um, and David, how about you? What would be your, um, your top learning or takeaway from, this, from the strategies that you've implemented at DivaBits? Thank you for that. Um, one of the key learning we have, you know, actually taken to heart is gender focused training is really doable um, to implement. It's very easy to implement and it's uh, very cost effective. You know, we used to have a very different format of trainings and, you know, have hotels and people meet in those conference rooms. And there's a lot of theoretical, uh, you know, trainings, you know, but, you know, when we, you know, became very intentional in terms of um, there's a better way that, you know, we have some good sales agents and we can document the best practices these sales agents are doing and have a platform for people to transfer these skills. It became much easier. And for even other agents seeing that a fellow agent is actually being able to do this, to be able to, you know, have this kind of work plan, you know, be able to execute certain strategies uh, and pitch differently depending on, you know, the different customers. It, you know, it has become easier for us to, you know, uh, do more trainings and, you know, be able to have us, you know, our agents well skilled and, you know, empowered. So uh, my key takeaway is that uh, this is a, a new way of life. And I think for us, we feel that uh, when we talk about gender focus, you know, sometimes, you know, it kind of like, you know, we had a focus on women, but uh, truth be told is that this kind of women impact also helped and changed uh, the narrative, even for how men, uh, you know, see their female or uh, women sales agents and even how they handle different customers. So this is something that we do want to continue doing and uh, we, you know, we're really happy have, you know, piloted this. Fantastic. That's a great way to end our segment here, David and Cynthia. Thank you both so much. Um, and uh, it's, again, um, it's a shame Emmy couldn't join us from Wana. He had another uh, challenge that he needed to address, but um, but just wanted to encourage everybody um, listening in to um, to be on the lookout for um, for the forthcoming how-to guide, so you can uh, read a bit more about what Cynthia, David. Um, Emmy and the other uh, businesses who um, and business leaders who took part in um, in this initiative um, really did from a from a very practical lens. Um, and so, with that, thank you again to you both for joining us today. And I will turn it back over to um, to uh, Charlotte. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, David and Cynthia for your insights. Um, okay, moving swiftly on to the next part of the agenda, because we're a little bit tight on time, I'd like to introduce GDC member Upower, who provides energy access to people in Cameroon currently living without access to the national grid. This year, Upower has been developing and rolling out a gender action plan to integrate gender across the organisation. And Caroline Frontigny, Chief Business Development Officer and co-founder of Upower, is here to tell us more. So over to you, Caroline. Hi, Charlotte. Thanks. And hi, everyone. And in the next six minutes, I will uh, go over um, our experience within uh, UPOA uh, with our um, uh, development and implementation of our gender action plan. Uh, so just as a quick introduction, UPOA, we are a solar home system pay-as-you-go distributor in Cameroon. And to give you an idea of our size, we have installed around um, 30,000 solar home system in Cameroon and the full, like the full team is uh, a little less than 400 people. 
Um, so first, how did the gender um, inclusion project even like started? And it started with like from several um, aspects. First one actually was the through the ESMS, so Environmental Social and Management System that was requested from some of our investors when they invested in UPOA back in um, 2018. And environmental, social, and management system is basically a tool to think about uh, all of the, to, to, well, to assess and to act on environmental, social um, issues in, in the company. And that's where we kind of ha also had gender uh, play a role, especially uh, regarding like the social aspects. And we, it was also the first time that we had kind of a, a global tool to assess the full company. So that was, that gave us a kind of um, an idea of uh, what could be done to, to address one specific topic across the full company. Secondly, I mean, oh, sorry, I have to go back to the slide. Thank you. Uh, one thing that was important was that, and as most uh, uh, solar actor, um, we were, we had like social value and we also had women in the top management and I'm, I'm the co-founder of the company. So we had this um, running in the company, but still there was, was nothing like really done across the company to assess and formalize uh, our gender projects. So what was really key was two things to actually start in implementing the gender action plan. First was to uh, appoint a dedicated resource to kick off and lead the project. And secondly, we had some uh, uh, financial motivation uh, from one of our investors to help push the project on top of the priority and that was really key in moving things around. So then we can go to the next slide. Um, so how did we do that? Uh, we actually used a lot uh, the the material that were already produced and the information that were already available on how to uh, implement a gender action plan. So I listed like the three that we use the most. Um, I think they are all of it. I mean, you can just Google it, you will find it or else. Um, happy to share the links with you. We also looked at what other companies uh, had done at the time, and we especially Peg uh, that uh, had uh, um, done some uh, gender action plan and that uh, published some documents with the Power Africa. Uh, then we started implementing our gender action plan. It was really three steps for us first, doing a, an analysis, then uh, doing a gender action plan and implemented it, and then third, monitor and evaluate, and then continue the, the cycle. Um, so first analysis, that what, what, what does that mean? So we started by looking at what we had, especially at the data that we had, and we did realize that we did not have all the data uh, available so to, to assess um, gender performance across the company, because our, our idea was really to have an overarching um, gender action plan from, you know, HR, like representation of sale agents, uh, for example, like fraud uh, committed by men or women, like, in, like social incidents uh, involving men and women to, you know, like how many women clients did we have? And so we realized that on some, um, some aspect, we did have some blind spots uh, in terms of uh, gender. Uh, we also evaluated all of our HR policies and practices. Um, we did some first assessment of some gender data, especially, for example, salaries. That was kind of the, one of the obvious ones to look at and realize that we didn't have all of the tools to, to, to do a proper assessment. So that was kind of, kind of one of the first points that we put in our gender action plan. Uh, some important points also, we also looked at our clients. So not only within the organization, but also people that we were addressing with our solutions to also make sure that we did not uh, kind of forget, you know, some women needs or um, because we mostly, that's one of also something that we realized that doing this uh, analysis, we mostly serve men clients or they are the ones signing contracts. Uh, so we also realized that and wanted to implement something to make sure that we were not missing some um, development opportunities and some business development opportunities uh, here. Uh, then the second step was actually to develop the plan and make some commitment. And so one of the key points that I want to share with you was that our gender action plan, I mean, the name sounds great, but it's it's really an Excel file in the end. So uh, it's basically listing some of the action that we, some of the objectives that we um, want to uh, target within the company and then have a plan and then have, you know, like the whole um, organization, like the whole company committing to the plan because it's usually across several different branches 
or several different uh, teams. Um, so that was one of the challenge, but um, nothing very fancy in terms of uh, the actual tool. It's uh, so I, I just put a, a little like snap extract of uh, what it looked like, and it's quite you know like simple. Um, what we also did was to organize some awareness session with all of the staff uh, within the company where we present um, what is gender and what uh, is the idea of our gender action plan within the company. And again, one point that I want to communicate with you that was super uh, interesting to do and I think for like our first feedback quite effective in uh, making sure that all of the company was um, uh, uh, what, like everybody in the team were okay with uh, the kind of like extra project that we were going to run with the gender, making sure so that the understanding on gender was uh, uh, shared across uh, companies because we are like multicultural company. And so the, the idea of gender uh, is not, uh, uh, while we, we were um, concerned that it might not be shared across the full company, full employee base of UPOA. So we did this awareness session and it was a very good way to, to kick, kind of kickstart and present the project across the, our organization. Uh, then the third point, the third step, so it's next slide, um, it's about monitor and evaluate. And this is something that we are you know, currently working on because we um, basically we started the project, I mean, the gender action plan project uh, in October. And it's only in June that we fully validated um, the, the action plan with every uh, uh, stakeholder. So like uh, management, uh, the teams involved and also um, our investors. Uh, so we only have like two months of feedback on monitor and evaluate, but we do see that it's important to have some regular sessions and to be flexible in adjusting the, uh, the, the actions to uh, meet the, the targets and objectives. Um, yeah, and like the little picture is the 8th of March at UPOA. It's, it's, a, it, um, it's a celebration that is quite huge in Cameroon. So. At first, these are, these are like the women uh, uh, in Yaoundé that you can see here. Uh, okay, so wrapping it up. So impacts and learning. So um, first impacts, we, we through the awareness session, we did realize that you know that this gender question we're taking being taken up by the team. We we did hear some conversation, you know, among like team members. Uh, so we do, we do think that it's quite a positive uh, impact already. Uh, we also well very concretely uh, already updated some HR policies and procedure, for example, um, like now every job offer uh, at IPOA uh, goes out with uh, like a, a bold uh, uh, sentence saying that uh, all like feminine or women candidature are quite uh, encouraged, are encouraged. Um, so that's already thing that uh, um, we have uh, put in place. We also see a rise um, in the percentage of store managers um, within the, the company. We do have the same challenge as um, uh, um, David and uh, like the, uh, well the other presenter presented uh, before. Uh, it's a challenge to have like a um, equal number of female and male agents. Uh, for us, we also have some issue of cultural um, uh, rules that women, you know, are not allowed to. I mean, it's not easy for women to uh, get out of their villages to travel around and sell products. Uh, so that's why we, we try to focus uh, the, um, the rise, like having um, a greater proportion of women as store managers for us, because it's it was more in line with uh, like some cultural norms in Cameroon. So that was one point. And I can go into more details um, if you have more questions about it. Uh, so some learning. So the project was well accepted by the staff, uh, I think also because like, in the world right now, there are more and more talks about, you know, um, well, women and women equality in the world. So we, we did see that there was no major, um, all the rest, there was no major backlash by the, from the team and everybody was quite happy that uh, as a top manager, we decided to put that uh, project uh, uh, as kind of the priority project for uh, the year. Um, we also realized that uh, we actually had some, like our, um, 
a lot of uh, our top performers were women agents, so sales agent, which was quite a surprise. I mean, we never actually looked at the data, so we had nothing in mind, but still it was a, a interesting point to, uh, to learn. And also that uh, women were, um, um, well, were making less frauds than uh, men agents, so, which is also something uh, that was uh, interesting to, to find out uh, by looking at the data. Um, we also saw that, as mentioned, uh, it's important to have like some a lot of or uh, some iteration on project and action to make sure that everybody is aligned uh, and uh, and is really backing up the project because it's, it's a project across the company. So we need to have a lot of buying from uh, the team. And so finally, so if I had to do like three key messages, is basically using use the tools that are already available. Uh, there are a lot of information out there and for us that was very um, relevant and quite sufficient to, to do a first um, gender action plan. Then I will suggest to follow the three main steps. So analysis, then a plan, then to monitor and evaluate regularly. And finally, the awareness session within the, um, the company. I mean, it was quite long because if we had like small session, it was from 10 to 15. People at the time, so it took some time to, to go through all of the company, but it was really useful uh, to, and we, we do see that it's in, it was a good investment for the project as a whole to take the time to, to do this session to explain um, what was the idea uh, behind the gender action plan. And with that, I'm done with my presentation. I didn't look at the time, but I hope I was quick and happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Caroline. Um, yeah, really interesting, lots of food for thought. And I think even just this emphasis that you can't, you don't know what you can't see and don't measure. So making sure that you get that baseline, um, that's hopefully a really tangible step that can kind of lead to very um, significant impacts after that. So we are almost at the end of the webinar. We've got a few minutes for a couple of questions. Um, and we've actually got a question, had a question from Soma at Energia asking when men are the decision makers on product sales, is it a challenge for the women sales agents to engage with and influence them? And do you have any suggestions on how to manage that? So throwing that out there to the panel, feel free to jump in if you'd like to start us off on that question. Or I can pick on someone. Sure, I think I can give it a shot. Um... It's about influencing men to buying products. And um, it's a very interesting angle in terms of sales that, um, you know, there are so many cultural dimensions that, um, you know, naturally women fear men. And, you know, there's that kind of fear too, is that women and men, you know, value different things. So those are some of the barriers. And, you know, there is also a barrier in terms of uh, the value of the product. So for smaller products, you know, if for women decision ma you know, making, you know, becomes much easier and the uh, men, you know, who majority of homes uh, in the rural areas are headed by men, don't have a problem with that. Uh, but when it comes to high value product, um, the home systems, um, may, you know, they might be costing probably, you know, between a hundred to $200 then that can become a challenge uh, in terms of, you know, approving or to make a decision whether to buy or not. And, and you know, and this is, you know, takes a series of um, pitching, you know, you pitch to the wife, you know, women group, and they tell you, you know, let me, you know, speak to my husband. Um, and, and that becomes very hard to close that sales. And, or even when you're at home, you know, like the husband is not around, so you come back again. And in most of our women sales agents, it did have the confidence to go and approach these men. So through this training that uh, we took, it became easier to know, uh, you know, as women sales agents, they could go directly and face the men, you know, uh, and be able to sell. We have had even women sales agents selling sort of products in, 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 a, in a men gathering, you know, you know, maybe in the market center. And, and they, you know, and once also they understand the different angle, for example, Women are you know, very emotional people. So when you are teaching the product and you're talking about uh, things that will influence uh, like children, you know, having more hours to study or more hours in the evening to do, you know, uh, their chores or to run the business, it becomes much easier. When you talk about, uh, when you're talking to men or pitching to men and you're telling about stories, 
about uh, other men who have actually bought the product in the community uh, or you know, the reduction in cost. And, and uh, you know, the angle about other men or other households that might have bought this product is an esteem issue or a social status issue, uh, status quo. So these men don't want to be left out in the community. And you know, they feel that, oh, so, you know, so and so bought this product, so I don't want to be left out. And that's a kind of like a different style of pitching because generally they need a product, but how you tell the story during pitching makes all the difference. In addition now to you know, you know, the capping in terms of spending. So when women now are more confident facing uh, men customers, it becomes much easier to, uh, to unlock these sales and to, to have more impact. Thanks very much, David. Um, I know that Soma also had another question here in the chat specifically about training materials. So if you could actually answer that in the chat box, that would be great. Thank you. Um, just want to squeeze in one more question for Cynthia and Caroline before we have to wrap up. So you both mentioned in your respective experiences about kind of cultural factors that have affected the capacity or um, potential of women sales agents in different contexts. So alongside rolling out the strategies that you've kind of discussed today, did you um, also engage with spouses, families, communities, et cetera, to address some of those pre-existing stereotypes or constraints? Um, and if you could just keep your answer to sort of one minute, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so thanks for that question. Um, so what we, I, I mentioned earlier that some of our male agents had bought into and were advocating for uh, the recruitment of more female agents. What we realized is we actually needed to do a lot of civic education on the benefits of women actually having jobs and earning an income and contributing to the households financially. And, you know, ideally you want to, you want to win the entire group, but we decided let's just win a handful of you know partners and spouses and male agents and these are the people who will become our essentially our ambassadors out there so uh, one of the ways that we market our products is through community meetings um, that we either arrange it by ourselves or we just leverage the ones that are already existing in the community structure and you know when we're there it's representation from the women and also the men standing on behalf of the women to speak to the community at large about the benefits of uh, you know the women becoming sales agents or even on the product front as the previous question to say this is important and if you're the decision maker in the household then you can absolutely you must you know acquire that product and you must encourage your young women and um, partners and spouses to become sales agents yeah and to to add to that i think it's we are facing like very complex situation it's not, it's not always you know like okay there is one problem like the woman cannot you know, travel or there is one problem like a woman doesn't know how to address a man it's it's very complex there are a lot of intertwined um trends and or, or like uh, influences on one situation so we try to to not you know like having like cookie cutter uh, solution like okay this is how it's gonna work but really having the sense that uh, like really instilling in people the sense that there is a gender issue in most of our actions with recruitment sales and making sure our agents especially the ones that are supervising other agents are aware of that and so they can guide um you know like recruitment or sales through this lens of the possible gender um uh, issue and try to find relevant solution. And we found out that ha having this awareness of the gender issue and also listening to how other people within the company were dealing with this um, gender issue helped a lot. Um, so we did not go as far as, you know, saying like, okay, let's share, like raise awareness or let's educate, you know, on how like it's okay for women to go to another village, you know, to sell, because we thought that this would be, I mean, quite a challenge and especially not really our place to you know try to to go like against cultural norms but more like making sure that when people are recruiting they kind of explain exactly what will be entitled um, for the job making sure that if there is any issue that they can address it through the gender lens and for like the specific issue of traveling in different villages making sure that other women because we have women that are top performer and even though like they 
also face these restrictions. So how do, how do they do? And making sure that they can share this information with men and women uh, within the company. And I, I do think personally that this, not, this is gonna be an, an evolving, um, challenge, evolving challenges uh, in, the, in the future. And there will not be like one solution. It will be um, a mix of like raising awareness and sharing you know, solutions that have worked uh, so that we can you know, move to water or something and like a, a situation that will uh, work for, for all genders. Thank you both so much. Um, I noticed there's another question or two in the chat. So if anyone wants to answer those in the chat, please feel free, but I'm gonna have to wrap up because we're on time. Um, so, oh yes, and please provide your feedback on today's session. So to wrap up, I think we've all learned that gender inclusivity makes sense, both from a commercial and an impact perspective. Um, last mile distributors are clearly well positioned to empower women in their businesses and more often than not becoming more inclusive enhances business performance. But becoming more inclusive isn't easy and they can't necessarily do this on their own. So everyone has a role to play. Distributors need to continue striving to build gender inclusive businesses. Organizations like the GDC need to keep doing research, supporting innovation and sharing it and uh, promoting the adoption of best practices, which we will hopefully be doing soon through the publication that Stephanie mentioned earlier. And of course, grant makers and investors need to encourage last mile distributors to become more inclusive and support them to do so in a sustainable way. So please get in touch with us if you've got any feedback on today's webinar. Um, if you hear about great stories of other last mile distributors who've developed gender inclusive business practices, let us know. And obviously reach out if you would like to partner on any of the activities that you might have heard about today or to support last mile distributors to become more gender inclusive. So on behalf of the GDC and Value for Women, thank you so much to our panelists and thank you to the audience for joining us today and we hope that it's provided you with lots of food for thought um, and we look forward to seeing you at future GDC webinars and events. Thanks so much. Thank you Charlotte and thank you so much to everybody as well. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you, bye. bye.